Good morning. Uh, welcome to this PW Legal World Dialogue with Mr. Quinn. Uh, Mr. Quinn is in India and it coincides uh, with this judgment from the Bar Council of India to allow for law firms and lawyers to practice in India. Uh, welcome, Mr. Quinn. And, uh, Thank you. It's a pleasure to, Thank you. It's a pleasue to be well, here. It's nice to meet you. It looks like you have a connection to God. You knew that this was happening in your... The I first know. lawyer to be in India after that it's, of of your size and of your influence. It's uh, it was a nice surprise. Uh, it certainly gave us a lot to talk about when we got here because the whole legal profession is buzzing about this development. Yeah, what do you make of this uh, development? Uh, do you think the entry of foreign law firms and lawyers in India uh, will help uh, the level of service delivery to go up? How will it impact? There are people who are still opposing it and saying there's no level playing field. Uh, the big law firms have this money power and they'll just take over the Indian law firms. What's in it for the Indian law firms and Indian professionals? Well, I, I think it, there's a lot of questions in talking to Indian lawyers. There's a lot of questions about this regime and how it will be rolled out and what actually it means. So uh, I think it remains to be seen exactly what the contours of it will be. But uh, I think it has the potential to be very positive. I mean, as you say, it has the potential to, look, we learn from each other. You know, foreign firms, it's not just going to be one way. The foreign firms come here and they take over business and they dominate the market and it won't just be the Indian lawyers learning from the foreign firms. There's a lot for foreign firms to learn about doing business and practicing law in this region. And this is a step that many, many countries now have taken. I can remember when Japan first opened its market to foreign law firms, must have been 25 plus years ago. And at the time there was a huge hue and cry among the large Japanese law firms that this will decimate our business, the foreign firms will take over, uh, it's gonna be a terrible thing. And guess what, that has not happened. The Japanese, the market in Tokyo is still dominated by those same Japanese firms and some other Japanese firms have, that have emerged. So I don't think it's a foregone conclusion that this necessarily means a loss of market share for Indian firms. And there'll be opportunities, uh, depending upon how this develops, there'll be opportunities for Indian lawyers to join foreign firms, you know, potentially for foreign, for foreign lawyers to join Indian firms. There'll be a cross-pollination a sharing of best practices, which as you say, could potentially raise the level of practice for everyone and make this a more hospitable environment for foreign investment generally. So uh, I think it has the potential to be very positive. Okay, uh, now since you talked about Japan opening up and foreign law firms going to Japan, uh, is there a playbook uh, to foreign law firms entering a new country, especially a country like India when this happens? How would you expect it to play out? Well, I mean, we, we need to learn what this is really going to mean, what the, what the Bar Council is comfortable with, what the uh, practicing lawyers are comfortable with. And, uh, you know, I, I think there's going to be a, my guess uh, is uh, that there'll be an evolution. As it's described right now, as I understand it, it's not all that different than what we encounter in China. We have offices in Shanghai in Beijing and Hong Kong. Uh, and in China, uh, most of our lawyers are Chinese nationals. They're admitted in China to practice law in China. But when they join our firm, an international firm, they have to stop practicing Chinese law. So the rule is, in China, if you join an international firm like Quinn Emanuel, you cannot give advice on Chinese law. We also cannot appear in court so we're not litigating cases in Chinese courts. That's not permitted under those rules. Those are both, as I understand it, those are both features of this proposed new regime in India. But yet we found that there's plenty for us to do helping Western companies that have issues in China. We work with Chinese law firms. We partner with them. We uh, help our clients from the West identify what's the best firm for this particular matter. You know, it's horses for courses. Uh, and then we help with facilitate having lawyers there in China 
facilitates our representation of those Chinese companies in problems that they get in the West. So, and on both types of issues, we're working with Chinese law firms. So it's not a zero-sum game that you know, every piece of work that it, you know, some foreign company gets is something uh, taken away from an Indian company. You know, it can be more for both. You know, there's in American legal folklore, there's a story you sometimes hear that in a village, if there's one lawyer, he starves. Second lawyer comes to town, you know, they start to, they start to make some money you know, together. Third lawyer comes to town, they all get rich. So we don't, you know, we see a lot of advantages to cooperation and lawyers working together. Okay, Mr. Quinn, let me ask you, you have a law firm that is in multiple parts in the world. Uh, you have more than 1,000 lawyers and legal professionals working within the firm. Um, how do you maintain that the quality and level of service delivery is maintained across all your offices? And also, how do you embrace diversity? Those are great questions. Look, uh, in terms of maintaining quality, it has to start with the decisions you make about what lawyers join your firm, right? They have to be outstanding lawyers to begin with. They have to be people who be great representatives of the firm. Every lawyer you hire is a message to the marketplace about who you are, who you think you are, what your standards are. So that's the most important thing. If you're hiring the right people, you have confidence in, that you know do excellent work, they have a track record of doing excellent work, then you know, you're on the right path to maintaining quality. Look, I mean, law firms are very, by and large, uh, I mean, I don't know if this is true in India, but the countries and the jurisdictions I'm familiar with, they're very horizontal uh, organizations. They're not hierarchical in structure. It's not like you have partners looking over the shoulder of other partners to checking their work. That's not how it's done. It's especially not how it's done with trial lawyers and litigators who tend to be very independent thinking and don't need somebody telling them, well, this is how you, know, you should adjust your strategy or you need to serve this subpoena or you need to get these documents. That's, that's simply not how it works. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that kind of paradigm is of people checking each other's work, that doesn't work. But what you can do is share best practices, share learnings. We certainly do that in our firm. Learn, sharing information about what we've learned, uh, sharing information about judges, courts, lawyers, jurisdictions, approaches to different kinds of cases. I mean, in our firm, we're constantly, every day, people are sending around emails, RFEs, requests for exemplars. Does anybody have an example of this? RFI, requests for information. Has anybody seen this before? Has anybody, does anybody have any ideas about this? So we're constantly within the firm brainstorming and sort of challenging each other. It's kind of a hothouse atmosphere in the firm of ideas and best practices. So that's how we maintain quality. Okay, Mr. Quinn, let me also ask you from your experience of five decades in uh, being... It's not, it's not five decades yet. Okay. <laughs> I have a way to go. Almost, almost. Well, I'm not counting. <laughs> okay. But from your large experience, uh, what do you think when the foreign law firms come into India, yeah. you already said you need to look at the detailing and contours yeah. of the opening up. Yeah. But do, do you see foreign law firms buying into Indian law firms? Or do you see foreign law firms coming on their own and hiring big names? What is the approach? You know, I don't know. Look, in the United States, you cannot, a non-lawyer cannot have an ownership interest in a law firm. You know that? You can in the UK. You can in Australia. So you have, have non-lawyers who are investors in law firms. You cannot do that in the US, except bizarrely in Arizona. Don't, I can't explain to you why that's true in Arizona but you can have non-lawyers. So when you say about buying into law firms, I don't know what the rules are here in the legal culture, whether law firms can be seen as investments. What you may be referring to is the potential of combinations and mergers. That's really hard to do, you know, for law firms to combine. You would think 
that the UK and the US legal cultures and law firm practice are similar enough that there would be examples of UK law firms that have merged with American law firms successfully. There aren't any. Maybe Hogan Lovells is the one that you might point to. There have been a number of UK firms that have negotiated. I think Allen and Overy had long negotiations with O'Melveny and Myers about combining. It's hard to do across cultures. Um, you know, it's so are you saying, are you alluding that it is more likely that firms like yours may set up on their own and then loosely partner with other law firms? Well, that's one model, you know. I mean, our, that's not our model. We don't, um, we don't have, uh, we don't like to have like best friends. We, we want to work with a number of different firms, get to know them, know their specialties and their capabilities, and work with other firms on particular cases, types of problems, which play to their strengths. Uh, but that's one model, sort of alliances. Another is, you know, depending upon what the bar rules permit, you might try to recruit a leading practitioner from an Indian law firm. Uh, recruit them into your firm to bolster uh, a growing new Indian law practice. So we'll have to see how that plays out. Okay, uh, now at this stage let me ask you. There is a use of technology in every sphere of life, in every area of work. How are law firms embracing technology, especially artificial intelligence? Has it impacted your work, your craft? Is it something that you see impacting your work even in a bigger way going forward? What are your views? It's on this? just beginning, but it will revolutionize law practice. This uh, chat box GPT has the potential to revolutionize law practice. You know, in the US, we have a very uh, fulsome, in the UK and maybe here, they call them disclosure rules. You share information. We call it discovery. And so you disclose to the other side enormous batches of data and information and discovery. And a lot of times, usually, the way it's what is to be produced is identified by search terms. And you will negotiate with the other side what search terms they're going to run on their various data or document management systems. You, that becomes a so, subject of negotiation. And so you get this pile of information and you may query that with additional search terms and the like. But it's all driven by search terms. With this chatbox GPT technology and others like it, you don't use search terms, you use natural language. You can put in a qu query, you know, in a breach of contract case, let's say relating to the capacity of a plant or facility, was it exceeded? Or a case involving force majeure where somebody's trying to, uh, they're saying they don't have to, they're excused from performance of the contract. You can query that data set. And it's ask, could the, what was the capacity of this plant as of this date and time? And you get back a narrative answer with citations to documents. Can you imagine that? It's a total revolution. Now, I'm not saying on day one you would only rely on that, because, but it becomes a very, very useful tool. So I, I see this completely changing, potentially changing litigation practice. And then you can get into analyzing judges' decisions, what judges have decided what ways, with which advocates, what style of writing seems to work with this particular judge. You can write a brief, and then you can tell the program, rewrite the brief in the style that this judge seems to like, because he's granted applications you know, in this style, or this, with this lawyer, or this way of writing, this formatting. And with the press of a button, you can change that to something that you think might have a greater set, based on data, based on history, that might have a greater six chance of success with that judge. I mean, the, I think we haven't yet fully understood all the applications of this technology, but it will be a revolution. Absolutely. Now, again, you have been in the legal services delivery ecosystem for a long time. Not that you? long. Yeah, okay, for whatever <laughs> time. Uh, and you've seen... Many people think I'm only 38. I thought you were 35. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. I'll go with that. Yeah. Uh, 
and the business has changed a lot in that many years and of course law firms have to align themselves to the changing environment and the changing business scenarios how do you think the legal profession has changed in the last few years and where do you think it is headed what are the changes you see in the way law firms work or they need to do to be able to keep pace with the future mobility of lawyers i mean i can remember when law firms would not hire associates who had spent you know they went to law school and they joined firm a they spent two or three years there they said they didn't like firm a or they wanted to move from new york to los angeles to pick a random case which was me by the way uh, and they wanted to change law firms and law firms would say no we grow our own we want to train them right out of law school in our way of doing things we're not interested in recruiting you know, associates who have spent some time at other law firms. That attitude is completely gone. Then the idea of the mobile partner. It used to be if you became a partner in a law firm, you were going to stay there until you retired at that same law firm. Completely changed. You see partners changing law firms all the time. So it's always sort of a, you know, business proposition, practice optimization proposition. If I join this other firm, is that going to be better for me and for my clients? It's a completely different attitude. The mobility of lawyers has, has totally changed. And then, you know, in the details of, you know, how we practice as litigators, you know, I, I you know, talked about search terms and how it's determined what documents you disclose in exchange. It used to be that you have to have eyeballs on millions of documents. You'd have contract lawyers, paralegals, young lawyers, and that's all they, they spend all their time looking at documents, originally in hard copy. The technology has completely changed that. You don't do those reviews initially with eyeballs on, on documents, hard copy or otherwise. You do search terms and you see what that yields. And then you may change the search terms based on what you get with Boolean logic. Well, I want this word, but not this word, or this word within so many, because you realize where the best the most useful documents are, are likely going to be. And the next revolution is going to be the artificial intelligence. So technology is going to completely change how we do things. Absolutely. No, also I will say one thing I don't think we're going to see is uh, robots getting up in courtrooms and arguing to juries. I think we're the last ones to go. <laughs> You'll still always have, you need that human being, that person making a connection with a decision maker. Do you think a uh, law firm fee should be uh, tied to success outcomes? Well, you know, in our country, we have contingent fee arrangements. Uh, that's unusual. I'm told you cannot do that in India. In the UK, you can do it a little bit. You can have some upside participation. Um, you can do it a little bit in Australia. It's, it's unlawful. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's unlawful in Japan, it's unlawful in Germany, it's unlawful in France. I don't understand the objection to it. What's wrong with the idea that if I, I have an agreement with my client, I, if, if we lose, I get paid nothing. If we win, I participate in the upside. And that's all subject to negotiation. I don't really get <laughs> the issue with that. It seems like a, a, a good way to do things, where the lawyer is completely aligned the with outcomes. the client. So, um, but most of the world doesn't see it that way. They think there's an opportunity, I gather, for the lawyer to manipulate the client. But I see it, it's usually the other, my experience, it's the other way around. So we have a contingent fee deal with the client that we're supposed to get, say, a third of the upside. We get a great result. We have a huge a settlement offer, which will get the client a lot of money. And the client says, mm, I'm not going to accept this unless you reduce your portion of the contingent fee that we agreed to from 30% to 20%. So the leverage, in my experience, goes the other way. Still with the client. Huh? Still with the client. Yeah. The client, you know, is, tries to leverage you back because the lawyer wants a payday. He's been working on this case maybe for years, getting paid nothing. It's a contingent fee case. He's not sending out bills and getting, he's paying the rent and everything else. And he doesn't, you know, he wants the, the case to resolve so we can get paid. The client can sit there like this and say, you know, I'm not really happy. I think you should reduce your fee. 
Uh, and if you reduce your fee, I'll accept this settlement. But otherwise, no, you keep working. You keep working. You carry the cost. Can you, you understand what I'm saying? Absolutely. That's what happens. The idea that the lawyer manipulates the client, it's the other way around. Absolutely very convincing. Now let me... That's <laughs> yeah, the truth. Yes. Uh, let me also ask you, in India, uh, law firms are attracting top tier talent. Both the professionals choosing to work for law firms and the other option being working for organization in the in-house legal department. In fact, all the in-house legal department are now hiring from top tier law firms. Uh, how do you see this uh, playing out in the near future? I'm not talking. How, how does it contrast with what happens in the US or UK in your experience? Well, no, it's the same thing in the US and the UK. Law firms are typically training grounds uh, for lawyers who decide they would rather have a different life. They're in-house and working for one client. Um, and then rarely, sometimes, they go back to private practice with a law firm. So um, it sounds like it's not dissimilar here in India to what happens in the West. Now, my last question. Uh, the entry that has been allowed by the bar council is limited. Do you see it further opening up? You already said we need to look at the granularity, we need to look at the contours. Uh, but you're not allowed to litigate, right? Uh, that has not been opened up. Uh, what do you think is the logic behind that? And is that a sound logic? Well, two answers. Um, obviously, the bar has an interest in maintaining quality, uh, an interest in the development of Indian law, and the uh, quality of the representation that's made available to Indian clients in India and the professionalism of practice in Indian courts. Those are all completely understandable concerns and you would certainly want to have some controls over who does that. Just because somebody's a successful litigator in another jurisdiction doesn't mean that their career has prepared them to successfully and properly uh, uh, pro and professionally litigate in uh, India. But I mean, let's also be candid. You know, the Indian bar, like bars in many other com countries, is protective of their, you know, their license. Their, their, uh, there is, I'm sure, an attitude here, as in elsewhere, among some people, that, you know, we, 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 this is a threat to our, our practice. Um, and, you know, they, they're, they're not accepting of that. And that's completely understandable. It, like in New Jersey. It can be hard if you're based in New York and you want to practice in New Jersey, it's, uh, you can do it, but there are some hoops that you have to go through. Lawyers in New Jersey don't want to be inundated by lawyers that come over and practice part-time uh, in, in uh, New Jersey. We have a process, you can, it's called Pro Hack Vice. You can get admitted for a particular case, you know, for one-offs. You apply to the court. But there'll be a limit on those. You cannot do maybe three or four a year. Same in Nevada. Uh, they don't want to see California lawyers coming to Las Vegas and doing, taking all the juicy cases. So you can appear in Nevada. You can get pro hack admissions, but only a specified number per year. There's a control over it. Same in Florida. So. Uh, this is, not an, this is not an unusual attitude. Like everybody else, lawyers are you know, protective of what they do. Mr. Quinn, in your, uh, you seem very knowledgeable about what's happening in India. Which are the law firms uh, that you think are natural partners for some of the large law firms that may want to seek partners in India? Which are the law firms that come to five, six, ten names? I'm not asking you to take just one name. Look, uh, I've been here 24 hours now uh, meeting lawyers, so I think it's far premature for me to be identify uh, names, as you suggest. I think the answer is probably less likely to be law firms, but more lawyers. You know, which lawyers for a particular problem, particular matter, for a particular client, are in the best position to help, our, uh, to help the client. 
And I, I don't think that, you know, we have relationships with many law firms in other jurisdictions, and we work with multiple law firms in each jurisdiction. So I, I, I don't think it's uh, a useful sort of thought exercise to even think in those terms. It's not how we think. Absolutely. Um, day before yesterday, BW Legal World had its 30 under 30 cohort for the top 30 lawyers below the age of 30. If you were to speak to these young lawyers who were, who were five, seven years into their profession and they had their whole professional, personal life ahead of them, what would be your advice to young lawyers in terms of how to build up their professional muscle? First off, practicing law at the highest level is a labor-intensive practice. There are, it sounds boring to say, there are no shortcuts. There are no Einsteins that can just cut through things and have these visions. Well, here's the way we're going to win this case, and we're not going to have to work 60 hours a week. I have this brilliant idea. That doesn't happen. Right? So you have to get used to the fact that practicing law at the highest level requires a lot of concentration and sustained effort. So that pays off. That pays off. The second thing I would say, keep your eyes open. Be opportunistic. Look what's going on in the marketplace. Look what other lawyers and other law firms are doing. Pay attention to how the law is developing. Try to get there first. So uh, the one, we have a saying in our firm that the side that figures out first what will ultimately matter in a case wins. So the side that figures out first what will ultimately matter wins. Lawyers tend to spend, litigators spend a lot of time on things that turns out they don't matter at all. You know, they scour the, they boil the ocean and turn over every stone. And it's not till the end of the case you realize, oh, well, the only things that matter, and this is true in most cases, there are only two or three things that ultimately matter. If you can figure that out early, that's enormously powerful. It gives you a big advantage in litigating the case and directing your efforts. It's less expensive, so you'll have a client that's happier with you because you haven't boiled the ocean. Those are two thoughts. Also, you know, in the last decade or so, branding for law firms, branding for lawyers has become very important. Uh, why do you think that has happened? And is it a good thing, bad thing? I mean, I have no view about whether it's a, a good thing or a bad thing, but I mean, law firms are businesses. And you know they want to get market share, they want to get mind share, they want to be associated, they want to have something that distinguishes them so clients think of them. It's completely understandable that they would want to have this type of branding, uh, like any business would. You want the consumers of legal services to be thinking of you and to understand who you are and what you stand for. It's an opportunity to message. And Mr. Quinn, apart from a very impressive uh, professional achievements that you've built over that many years. You also have five children. I do. Uh, you've done the Ironman thrice. Oh, it was a number of years ago. Yes. Yeah. And you also just shared with me that you uh, you spent time with the bulls in Pamplona. I ran with the bulls in Pamplona. I and swam from Asia to Europe. I swam the Bosphorus in Istanbul. I climbed almost to 24,000 feet on the North Pole of Everest. I've been very lucky to do a lot of fun and challenging things. Why do you things. do all this? It's challenge a good question. Yourself. Challenge yourself? I don't know why. Or new experiences? New experiences, challenging. Maybe I like to suffer. With the opening up of the legal services arena, there is a possibility that India may emerge as an arbitration center. What does India need to do to be able to emerge as a leading center for arbitration across the world? Do you think it's a possibility? It's a challenge. I mean, India starts with uh, an advantage in that uh, you have a really pro-arbitration culture here. People, for whatever reason, I guess delays and time it takes to litigate cases in Indian courts. Indian companies opt for arbitration a lot in their agreements. So arbitration is supported here. You have a sophisticated domestic arbitration practice. I think that's a good start. 
To become an international arbitration, there's a lot of countries and cities in the world that have tried to become international arbitration centers. Uh, you know, uh, you, uh, the new mayor from uh, the, US, the new US ambassador to India is a man named Eric Garcetti, who was mayor of Los Angeles, where I came from. And when he became mayor, one of the things he asked people was, why isn't Los Angeles an arbitration center? We're in the middle of East and West and Latin America. There's people from all over here. And so he was interested in this. And it turns out, it's really hard to do. Uh, Korea has tried that. Japan has tried that. And they're re they haven't really been able to become centers. It's, you're really looking at Shanghai, or um, you're looking at um, Singapore, Hong Kong, Paris, London, to a degree Miami for Latin American work, uh, Geneva, uh, Stockholm, Sweden, especially for things related to Russia. Um, there's a lot of inertia in the international arbitration community. It's a very insular group of people who work together. They sometimes appoint each other to panels, and there's sometimes the advocate, there's sometimes the panelist. They have conferences together, they speak to each other, they write, read each other's right. It's kind of a, some people say it's like a club. And so somehow you have to get ownership, uh, participation in that. Though they're really the people that have to be persuaded that there's a case for India's becoming an international arbitration center. You need, there are some countries where um, the judiciary is not really supportive of arbitration. Uh, they'll meddle in an arbitration proceeding. Arbitration practitioners don't like that. They want to be left alone to do their arbitration thing the way they want to do it. They don't want some judge, they want the other side to be able to run into the local court and then the judge is looking over the shoulder changing the rules. So you need a, uh, a, a, a judiciary that's hospitable to arbitration. So, I mean, I, I, frankly, I think it's a, it's a challenge and it would require some vision uh, like what you see in uh, Singapore. I mean, Singapore has, you know, the government there has kind of promoted it and willed uh, Singapore into becoming an arbitration center. It didn't used to be, and it's now as important or more important than Hong Kong. But, you know, I think it can be done, but it's, it's really going to take a concerted effort from the top. Thank you, Mr. Quinn. Pleasure.